Welcome. I'm just going to give you a very, very brief welcome right now before we get welcomed by our host. And then I'm going to welcome you again to the evening. But first, let's have a host's welcome from our global media partner, Tronk and Mark Campbell. Thank you. All right, here's welcome two of three. Um, good evening, I'm Mark Campbell. I'm the Senior Vice President of Digital Marketing here at Tronk. Tronk is the publisher of the Los Angeles Times, the Chicago Tribune, and several other award-winning news titles around the country. Um, we're so glad to welcome you all to this historic Los Angeles Times building um, and to the World Technology Network's 2016 Innovation Celebration. Um, as you well know, uh, the WTN and its members are focused on innovations and emerging technologies. We at Tronk share that vision, working very hard every day to not only bring our readers the trusted journalism that they count on from our storied brands around the country, uh, but also to do so in the most compelling and contemporary storytelling methods. So we're trying to innovate each and every day, and we felt very aligned with MT, uh, WTN's mission in that regard. Uh, that's why my colleagues and I are, are so proud to be the WTN's global media partner, as well as tonight's host. So uh, thank you for joining us here this evening. Um, and now I'd like to officially welcome back uh, the WTN founder and chairman, Jim Clark. Hello again. So I'd like to welcome you again to this evening, which is the uh, 15th annual celebration of the World Technology Awards. I want to tell you first um, about the WTN, but before I do, I want to thank Tronk again for being our partner. We're very excited about the interesting things we're going to do, and we're going to talk a little bit later about one of the projects that we're doing to kick things off uh, and uh, explore the potential of this partnership. I want to particularly thank Mark for his help. Uh, this is not Mark's regular job, uh, and he was really went beyond the call of duty to help uh, pull this together this evening and to help initiate our relationship. I want to thank Arlene Valdez um, from the LA Times for helping this evening uh, pull this together as well. Um, on our team, I particularly want to thank uh, Kevin, Marina, and Jeff. And for Tronk overall, I want to thank uh, the initiator uh, of this relationship, uh, Malcolm Cassell. So thank you all to them. So what the heck is the World Technology Network? The World Technology Network is a global association of the peer-elected, most innovative people and organizations in science and technology and related fields. So if you think about how the 20th century was largely driven by politics, and it may be that this 21st century will end up being driven by issues like that as well. But you could argue that the 21st century is driven in large degree by science and technology. What used to be in the back pages of newspapers and covered well by publications like the LA Times are now the front page stories. Not only that, the underlying infrastructure and purpose and direction and opportunities related to publications like the LA Times are now driven by science and technology. If you think about almost any other story in the world, directly or indirectly, it's now driven by science and technology. Economics issues, political issues, health issues, income issues, everything right now is being driven by that. Now in the 20th century, you had an organization like the UN in response to the crisis of no one talking to each other in the world of politics. And 17 years ago, when I was beginning to think what the 21st century was going to be like, I thought uh, 
as a 50-year project for my life, I thought it'd be really interesting to identify who are the most innovative people and organizations in the world around all the issues of science and technology and the subsidiary and related issues that will be creating this century every year to identify them in a process that was credible, which I felt was most credible by doing that with the opinion of their peers, and then form a community of those people that was global. So we now have over a thousand peer elected fellows of the World Technology Network in over 40 countries around the world who are the most innovative in their fields, not in my opinion, not in our staff's opinion, but in the opinion of their peers. So how does the World Technology Network work? The World Technology Awards, although it's very nice to have the awards program and it's very nice to be here and I'm, very, I'm not belittling that at all, but the world has a lot of awards programs. What we wanted to do was create an awards program that was a vetting mechanism for our membership. So it's a virtuous cycle. Every year, we ask our members within each category, who do you think is doing the work of the greatest likely long-term significance in your field? And remember, our members are all over the world. And then we take those nominees and we contact them, supplemented by our own research of interesting ones, and sometimes self-submitted now as we become much better known. And we uh, give them the opportunity to submit uh, further supplemental background information, or we supplement it ourselves. Then we go back out to the members in that category, and we ask them, looking at this pool, who do you think are your top five in order of preference? And we assign points to all that, so it's a pretty thorough process. And what you get out of that is collective wisdom. It gives you a really good picture, a sort of snapshot of these global revolutions in progress in the opinion of their peers. So the peers are nominating, the peers are judging, and it's a virtuous cycle, adding each year to the most innovative. And if you think about, again, what this century is about, science and technology, it's a pretty interesting community. And we didn't start using this phrase, but other people started saying the World Technology Network is a global community of the people creating the 21st century. I think it's a pretty interesting community. So we do certain events around issues that uh, maybe other people don't cover, um, that we think are where things are headed. Um, in particular, we've taken a real lead in the last uh, few years around an issue I've been interested in for several years, technological unemployment. How all these new technologies are gonna uh, create loss of jobs. Create new jobs, but maybe not the same amount that are lost. And what are the implications for that as a society, um, with a global society, with uh, billions of people being added that are gonna need jobs, billions of people losing jobs that aren't gonna be replaced, and what are the political implications? Well, we thought a few years ago that this could create the rise of populist political candidates. We thought this create, could create the rise of economic anxiety, if not unemployment, economic anxiety. And economic anxiety creates ripe environments for certain kind of politics. So two years ago, we talked about how you might get things like Brexit, or you might get things like what happened in this recent US uh, political election. Um, and we have just seen the tip of the iceberg with the technologies. When AI hits, it's gonna get even more intense. And anyone who thinks they have a secure job in this environment doesn't in the sense that even if you are, the people in this room are among the most uh, likely to benefit from these changes, you're gonna to have to reinvent all the time. So individuals are gonna to have to reinvent, industries are gonna to have to reinvent, companies, nations, etc. Incredibly interesting time. So let me talk a little bit about that time. I call what we are entering right now the phase change. A phase change is when you go from, let's say water goes from a state of liquid water to ice, or liquid water goes to steam. It's the exact same thing, but it's entirely different too. I think we're gonna have more civilizational change in the next 20 to 30 years for humanity than the last two to 3,000. 
Why do I think that? I can go in a lot of detail about that, but I'll just simply say that we are getting to the elemental, the fundamental. Matter, we were always told, that is the way, that is what things are. They are made of matter. And through chemistry and other things with a lot of effort, we've been able to change it a little bit. We're now getting to the elemental level of matter. So we will very soon be able to make anything, anywhere, at any time. Anything, anywhere, at any time. Think how that changes the fundamentals of civilization, of economics, of resources of the impact on the environment. Secondly, biology. We used to start with the idea that you were stuck with the body you're born with and you're going to die. And a lot of societies organized around those principles, particularly our mortality. But we are now getting to the point where almost every year we get very close to adding more than a year to our life expectancy for every year that passes. Once that threshold is crossed, barring accidents, and on a uh, collective level, we are heading towards a kind of immortality. I don't mean that literally in the short term, although there are people who think that's going to be quite possible in several decades, but right now we're setting, heading, heading to a period where um, we might have to plan for the idea that we might be in a pretty good healthy state for an indefinite period of time. And again, think of how our religions are based on mortality, our social structures, our relationships are all based on uh, the, the constrained nature of lifespan. Stuck with the body you're born with, I mean, we are, we are reinventing at the cellular level, at the DNA level, what you can do with your body. That changes a huge amount. The final thing, and perhaps most important thing, is information. We are breaking everything down into information. And that gives us the ability to understand the underlying nature of everything and to manipulate everything. And I use that without exaggeration. So the kinds of things that are happening right now that are, again, just the tip of the iceberg that we're doing with uh, large amounts of data, that we're doing with being on the cusp potentially of true artificial intelligence to the degree that we will be no longer the only uh, super intelligent species on the planet and what will that mean as we share the planet um, the reality that we will be able to create with virtual reality indistinguishable realities to our reality and those realities will be able to have the, a nature that we wish that to me seems like the the criteria for godlike abilities for existence. It may not be the existence in matter, but it's the virtual existence. And in a world where, where you can make anything at anywhere at any time in, in reality, and you can do anything and change your body in reality, and then we're at the going to have a parallel existence in virtual reality, again, more change in the next 20 to 30 years than the last two to 3,000. Phase change in human civilization. There are two responses to that. Fear and pullback is one. And it's not an irrational thing, right? It's what's kept us alive. When, when a huge amount of change happens and we've been adapted to exist at a certain pace of change, and let's even say a, 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 most of the history of our species has been when there's been almost no change, that's what we're adapted for. So no wonder there would be extreme difficulty in coping with rapid change, and no wonder that human institutions and culture and politics would react against that with fear and pullback. The other response, potentially, is curiosity and exploration. And that exploration leads to then kind of navigation, surfing the change. So we see people who seem to be extremely excited by the change, and they seem to be people who are benefiting the most from the change, and I would include all of us in that. And there's people who are very fearful about the change, because the change doesn't seem to be setting themselves up for the kind of success that they would like, or even just psychologically, it's just too fast, too soon. 
and we're at the tip of the iceberg. The pace hasn't really started yet at the level that it's going to get to. I'm not saying which is better or worse. I'm just saying that that seems likely that humans will react that way. So let's talk about innovation for a second. Innovation is new ideas that work. Well, where else do we see that? We see that in nature. What we call innovation in the human world is mutation in the natural world. And mutation, in a huge percentage of cases, doesn't work. Cancer is pretty much mutation that doesn't work. But mutation that does work are innovations in nature that are adaptive, that work better. Most of them don't, but some of them do, and enough of them do on a regular basis that you get evolution. So innovation in the, the, in the natural world is evolution. Innovation is evolution. Evolution is that. And innovation, therefore, is the way life is in action. Innovation occurs because of curiosity, perseverance, focus, and of course serendipity. When we celebrate innovation, we celebrate those things. Just spoke for a moment about serendipity because the motto of the World Technology Network is encouraging serendipity. You would think that a network of all these top scientists and technologists and people working in related work would be uh, very focused on the the uh, conscious, persevering efforts to reach a goal. But we have found for the last decade and a half that serendipity plays the biggest role. Happy accidents, unexpected, fortunate findings, encounters between people at a conference or having drinks at an event like this one, being stuck on an airplane next to a stranger who then becomes your spouse or your business partner, it's taking you out of the expected, and we're all used to filtering in order to get through life, filtering out all the stuff that seems extraneous and just focusing on the things we know are important. And that's very important to get through, that kind of planning. But most of the big changes happen on the edge in unexpected ways, particularly innovation. It's a kind of mimetic innovation, a kind of mimetic mutation of our expectations. So when we celebrate Innovation, I believe we celebrate life. We celebrate the rules of life and the unexpected surprises of life. Why are we here tonight? Tonight we are here to mark the announcement of the winners of the 2016 World Technology Awards, which will be announced in full. We'll announce all the winners later tonight after this is over, it'll go live on our website, and then tomorrow on the Los Angeles Times website with more information, of course, than our website, given how thorough they are. Um, we are also here to hear from some of the winners. When we decided to do this innovation celebration event, we, th we hoped that some of the winners would be here, and uh, we actually have uh, more than a handful. And uh, we also have some of the other finalists who are here. And remember in our voting that the, the way the voting works, that to be a finalist, you have to be in the, roughly the top five or six uh, in the opinion of your peers worldwide. So being uh, you know, second, third place, being in that finalist pool is pretty darn close compared to everyone else in your profession to be a winner. So we're very lucky to have some of our finalists who didn't win here tonight. Um, we're going to hear from some of them in person. We also have some videos from uh, winners, and, uh, winners that couldn't be here. Um, and so instead of just announcing the awards, both Tronk and the WTN thought that let's give people a taste of some of these individuals and organizations being here. So here we are to have that taste and experience being in the presence and hearing from some of the people 
creating the 21st century. So again, I say welcome. So let's get started. First, I'm going to tell you very briefly, and then we're going to see some videos, about this new project that we're kicking off with Trunk. We're calling this the Catalytic Community. We already have a community, but that community works with each other. We introduce our members to each other. They experience each other. So we thought, wouldn't it be interesting if in partnership with Trunk, we could create uh, a profiles, video profiles, of the 175 finalists from this year's group, um, supplemented eventually by all of our members, and ask them a series of common questions, and then put those videos up in interesting interactive ways, and also have them tell people watching those videos how they could in engage with them and participate and help them and support them through partnerships, through time, or through money. So that's being built, but I want to show you two samples of the responses from two of this year's finalists. My name is Jeffrey Ozen, and I'm one of three distinguished university professors at the University of Toronto, which has about 3,000 faculty. I would say that my work over the past 45 years has been instrumental in the development of the field of nanochemistry. My group is renowned for their pioneering research in nanochemistry, a field that has defined, enabled, and popularized a chemical approach to nanomaterials. A rapidly expanding field, a cornerstone of modern chemistry, and a foundation for innovative nanotechnology in advanced materials and biomedical science. This work has established me as a founding father of nanochemistry an emerging and dynamic interdisciplinary field and an essential driver of the 21st century nanotechnology revolution. I was there in the 1970s at the birthing of the science that is now called nanochemistry, an approach for synthesizing nanoscale structures and integrating nanosystems from the bottom up, literally atom by atom. Today, nanometer scale matter and nano-sized voids are the central building blocks of nanoscience and the groundbreaking breaking works of me and my group of able co-workers in wide-ranging fields provided the spark that helped make it happen. My work on a chemistry approach to nanomaterials has spawned pervasive applications in the fields of advanced materials and biomedicine. It has been fantastically satisfying to see so many scientists and engineers working on nanochemistry problems around the globe, in universities, industries, national labs. So much funding going to nanochemistry, so many books and courses on the subject, so many products and processes based on nanomaterials that are making our world a better and safer place. I say, better living through nanochemistry. Rising to the grand challenges of our times that can be solved through nanochemistry often required crossing the boundaries between fields, working with multidisciplinary groups of chemists and physicists, material scientists and engineers, learning how to communicate across these boundaries, the goal being to change the prevailing view in a targeted field. The greatest challenge for me was always to identify an important problem that needed to be solved, often residing in another field. It was Richard Feynman's speech on Room at the Bottom, all the information in the Library of Congress on the head of a pin. It inspired me to try to synthesize structure and composition, size, shape, surface, and defect-controlled nanomaterials, and self-assemble them into well-defined architectures with design function and utility. My industry colleagues at Union Carbide, Edith Flanagan, Bob Bedar, at Monsanto with Jim Roth, at Mobile with Charles Kresge, they played a gigantic role in inspiring, educating, and enabling me to achieve my research dreams. I'm often asked by my students, how can I be creative like you? Where do you get your ideas? What distinguishes your research from others? What's the plan? My response is usually just work with me. 
I follow my nose. There's no point in being second. I have no plan, but plenty of ideas and plenty of experience. Intelligent serendipity is what I call it. This has played a major role in most of my breakthroughs. And recall, a breakthrough is a discovery pregnant with promise, and then the hard graph begins. In my style, in my style of adventurous, high-impact, technology-relevant research, I'm always looking for what I call patient, passionate, persistent philanthropists, so-called P4s. This is especially true with the climate change challenges that we all face, where I need serious funding to fuel my most recent obsession of carbon dioxide utilization, where CO2 is viewed as an asset rather than a liability, a chemical feedstock rather than a waste product, a way of utilizing CO2 for making value-added chemicals and fuels. It's a chemical and engineering solution in the war against climate change. Hi, my name is Peer Fischer. I'm a professor of physical chemistry and I have labs at the Max Planck Institute and the university both in Stuttgart, Germany. We work on nanorobotics and targeted delivery. We were inspired by nature's bacteria to build micro and nano swimmers that can overcome the many protective layers in the human body, like the blood brain barrier or the mucus lining of the stomach that all prevent the direct targeted transport of pharmaceuticals through tissue. And our lucky break came when we learned about a bacterium, Helicobacter pylori, that can give stomach ulcers, but it uses a chemical trick. Basically, nature has built a fully functional nanorobot that can swim and use enzymes and chemistry to navigate through the protective layer of the mucus. So we thought we should be able, as physicists, chemists and engineers, to build nanorobots that can do the same thing. For this, we first have to develop a new nanofabrication method that allows us to build nanoparticles that can mimic bacterial flagella. Here are the world's smallest artificial drills. And then we basically could show that they can be functionalized so that they're chemically active. And then we activate them with a magnetic field to penetrate the mucus from the stomach lining. Our work therefore shows that one can penetrate real viscous biological media and tissues. And our vision is to extend this work and to enable targeted delivery for diseases and in particular those that currently cannot be treated or targeted because a whole body systemic application of a drug would be too dangerous. And that is where the targeted movement of these nanoparticles is really helpful. This effort is possible because we have a really great team of enthusiastic students and postdocs. And if you share our vision, then our research can be helped through collaborations and through funding. That gives you a little uh, taste of the uh, kinds of incredible work that's being done by the finalists for this year. Think of, I mean, those two, they're not, it's mind blowing what they're doing, but it's not atypical of the 175 finalists. So think about a community where not only the network, the World Technology Network, we're introducing them to each other. Think of what Jeffrey Ozen said about the work that he's doing on climate change and think of what would happen if we introduced Pierre Fisher to Jeffrey Ozen to work together on projects. It's the kind of serendipity that happens by definition randomly, but we're encouraging it. So now let's start talking about the winners. The next category, we have a video from uh, the winner in energy. 
and that is Guess Who? We thought we'd hit you a lot of Jeffrey right now. This is a short video from, uh, from Jeffrey. What? Or that is the one? Yeah. Guess what? <laughs> that one, first one was long enough that it counts for both. Uh, so, um, the next category is IT hardware. And the winner is, of course, I knew there was a reason we did that. Um, the winner is, of course, Pierre Fisher. So congratulations to, to both of them. Design. These are the finalists for this year. And they're all, of course, new WTN fellows by being finalists. And the winner is Benaz Farahi, <laughs> who is with us tonight. <laughs> So for any winners that are here or finalists, wh what we'd love to do is not just say thank you, although you can say that, is to say, here's what I do, and here's why I do it, and explain to people what your vision is. So thank you. Congratulations. Wow, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Wow. Um, I'm extremely honored uh, to receive this award. It means a lot. Um, so my name is Benaz Farahi. Uh, I have trained as an architect. I'm a designer based in LA. I do work in the intersection of art, architecture, fashion, and technology. So I combine what I do. I combine a lot of interactive technology with whatever we wear every day or in the spaces that we occupy. So I put interactive technologies, let's say, into the garments that we wear, and I think about the social or cultural context that how we interact with the people around. So for instance, I um, made a garment that uh, it has a facial tracking camera that it can respond to where you're looking, with where the other peoples are looking, looking at. So um, it's, it's really about how we can change the perception of the people and how we can change uh, how other people perceive you in the uh, social si cycle. Um, so, um, um, in this way, uh, I've been extremely fortunate to have a support from um, Autodesk PR9 company up in San Francisco. Uh, amazing uh, people that have helped me throughout this process. But also, uh, I'm doing my PhD in media art at USC here in Los Angeles, uh, which I'm grateful uh, for all the supports. Um, and lastly, I want to again thank um, WTN for this, this award. It means a lot. Thank you very much. You can see why I love my job. I mean, this is, there's everyone, they're so interesting. Okay. The next category is education, and we have a video from the winner. Hello, I'm Dr. Kimberly Scott, Associate Professor and Executive Director of the Center for Gender Equity in Science and Technology here at Arizona State University. I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to attend tonight. I'm so excited. Thank you so much for providing me the honor of being one of the awardees for this year's World Technology Award. Not only do I accept this award on behalf of the Center for Gender Equity and Science and Technology, but for all of our collaborators and amazing staff, as well as the girls and boys who have participated in our program in the past, as well as those who will participate in the future. I'd like to share a little bit about our work here at the Center for Gender Equity in Science and Technology. Hopefully you will enjoy. Thank you so much and happy holidays. Yes, it's a one-of-a-kind center in the nation that is exclusively focused on documenting, um, building capacity, building programs, and advocacy specific to African American, Latina, Asian American, and Native American women and their pursuits in science, technology, engineering, and math. There are three departments of the center. There is the knowledge building arm that is dedicated to synthesizing as well as presenting research that is attainable and accessible to a large audience so that we can really make sustained and scalable efforts through informed uh, empirical data. There's the capacity building arm, which presents programs such as uh, my nationally recognized CompuGirls program, 
which provides a series of multimedia courses to adolescent girls, from digital storytelling to culturally responsive co-robotics. And then there's also the advocacy arm. And it's within the advocacy arm that we attempt to culminate the work from the research arm and the capacity building arm and to translate that information to decision makers such as policy makers, legislators, and community grass top and grass root leaders. We have a finalist here tonight, and I would like to invite that finalist up to the stage, if they're willing, to talk a little bit about their work. Would you like to? Sure. I think we'd all enjoy that. Thank you. Hello, JP Benini. Uh, when people ask me what I do, uh, I jokingly say, I play with toys all day. And it's kind of the truth. Uh, but what we're building is trying to be, without any hyperbole, the most technologically advanced, smartest smart toy that the planet has ever seen. But we're just trying to be fun about it. Um, your phones have a ton of really, really neat technology in them. Uh, so much so that the iPhone had to remove its speaker, uh, headphone jack, and the Samsung phone literally explodes. Uh, but it's not meant for kids. And kids play with it, and they get some enjoyment out of it, and it's changing the way that they grow to the point where uh, children will swipe at magazine pages and try to click on things that don't actually animate. So what we're trying to do is create technology for kids, the latest and greatest of what we have today, but built for them. And we did that with a toy dinosaur, a dinosaur that they could talk to, that they can interact with, that has the brains that, when they ask why and keep asking why, it could keep answering their questions. But it's an instantaneous feedback loop. As soon as we propose uh, a question to them, we're getting that answer back and we're understanding, did this kid actually understand uh, the information that I've given them? So we can create a customized educational experience, one-to-one, -one, by way of a play pattern, by way of a toy, that we can keep kids uh, interactive and questioning and, and growing intellectually by uh, stimulating them on a very personal level, all with play. And that's what I do, and I love my job. And I appreciate the uh, World Technology Network for bringing me in, and uh, we all hope to great, make really great things in the future. Thank you. Next category, environment, individual. In some of our categories, in 10 of them, we have individual and organizational awards. These are the finalists and the new W10 fellows. And the winner is Mahar Damak, who is here tonight with us. Well, this is a complete surprise, and I'm so honored for uh, this award, especially given the amazing list of finalists uh, that I saw. So I'm a PhD student at MIT, uh, working with uh, Professor Varanasi, and I'm working on um, reducing or eliminating chemicals waste in agriculture. So <clears throat> uh, feeding the world is one of the most important challenges of our century, and um, we have been relying more and more on the massive use of chemicals, pesticides, and other toxic chemicals. And um, the application of these chemicals is very inefficient. And actually, studies have shown that only 2% of applied chemicals end up on their target. 98% goes to waste, pollutes our waters, causes serious diseases, and uh, is a, an economic cost for the farmers. So what we've, uh, we've done at our um, lab at MIT is uh, we've identified the bottleneck in this process, why this is so inefficient. And, we've uh, and the reason is most plants are water repelling. So when you try to spray stuff on them, the, the, the liquids don't stick and they go into the soil. So we've developed an additive that's completely plant and animal extract space. So it's biocompatible and biodegradable. And that additive can be added to the chemicals you spray to make them stick much better. And we have shown up to 10 times increase in efficiency. 
So uh, <coughs> we hope that with this technology, we're, pl we're planning to uh, commercialize this technology in the near future by starting a company, and uh, we hope that we can uh, significantly reduce uh, waste and pollution in agriculture. Thank you so much for the award. By the way, it's, it's impressive when you hear these things, but you, then if you take a pause and you start to think of the implications of, of an innovation like that, where 10 times more effective in use in spraying and pesticides on agriculture in the world. I mean, just think of the implications of that worldwide. Think of the problems that come from the inefficiency and the pollution and the absorption and the runoff and the health problems and so on. I mean, this is, these, this is in a lab. This is now going to soon be commercialized. It's incredible, the impact on the environment. I, I just, I, I clap for all the finalists, but that, that's one of the ones this year that it deserves. I'm going to clap again for that, so thank you. <laughs> but I don't have favorites. So next category is ethics, and we have a video. Yeah. Dear all, I'm really honored to be selected as a finalist for the World Technology Awards 2016. I'm really sorry that I cannot be there with you in person. But uh, in order to compensate for that, I would like to tell you a little bit about my work in this short video. I'm a professor in the philosophy of technology and a co-director of the design lab here at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. And my team and myself are working, among other things, on a theory to understand the moral dimension, the moral significance of technologies. Not only to understand it better, but also to take it into account in the design of new technologies. Now this is a counterintuitive idea, right? Ethics is normally seen as something human. Still, as I explain in my book Moralizing Technology, there are good reasons to see a moral significance in technologies too. Technologies organize all kinds of relations between humans and their environment, like the relation between patients and doctors are somehow influenced by telecare technologies like the relations between parents and fetus are somehow mediated by ultrasound. By understanding how technologies affect such kind of relations, we can understand better how they inform ethical choices and decisions that we make. We can also try to redesign technologies, taking this into account. So that's what we typically do in the little philosophy lab that I'm housing at the design lab here in Twente where we try to work on a method to help designers to think through the moral dimension of technologies and to use it in their design activities. I'm really committed to connecting the philosophy and ethics of technology to practices of design and innovation and to be nominated for the World Technology Award 2016 is really a very big recognition of all our efforts. Thank you very much. Finance, in the individual category. These are the finalists. Take a moment to absorb that. It's a pretty impressive list. Many of these people drive through their funding and their advice many of the most important technologies of the last decade or two. Um, and some of them are doing what they're doing right now in very interesting ways. The winner is Swati Chaturvedi, <laughs> who is here with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for the award. It's uh, an honor to be here. Um, and I do want to share what we do. So uh, I run Propellex, which is an investment site. So it's, a, it's a site where we connect accredited investors with startups. The key difference is we focus only on science and technology companies. And here is the reason why. If you think of companies like Genentech or Tesla or SpaceX, these companies have changed the world and they've generated very high returns. You just have to look at the Dow Jones Index and you know why. Most of the companies on the Dow top, top 30 were founded on breakthrough technologies of their times. Yet, these kinds of technologies have a very hard time fundraising. And that is what we are about to change because we know there are passionate investors worldwide who are willing to support these technologies, but there has been no channel to make that happen. 
And so we make that happen by creating an online investing site where passionate investors that support specific causes or challenges that the world faces today, whether it be disease or uh, hunger, you know, we can create more food using technology, we can combat climate change using technology, we can combat cancer using technology. Um, those are the things that we want to enable. So we do uh, want some help in that. It's a, it's a very big vision. Um, and so the way that we can get your help is by spreading the word. So if you know investors, certainly direct them to propellx.com. If you know startups that are looking for, um, that, are, that are developing breakthrough technologies that can change the world, we want to help them. So that's our main cause here. And uh, thank you once again for the award. Sometimes people say that our members, uh, due to their lives, we should call it the uh, World's Busiest People's Awards. But I often think that it actually it's the World Awards for people who really love their jobs. Because I think you can tell with everyone coming up here. Next category is health and medicine individual. These are the finalists and new WTN fellows. And the winner is Yoshinori Osumi in Japan. So, congratulations, Yoshinori. <laughs> not, not bad when you win a Nobel Prize in Medicine and a World Technology Award in Health and Medicine in the same year. <laughs> Which one will he cite most often in his bio? We also have here a finalist, I believe. Yes, he is. OK, welcome. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you uh, for actually like, you know, uh, I, I didn't expect when I received the email. Uh, but anyway, um, I actually build electronics, uh, but um, there is a bit of history. Uh, I graduated from UT Austin 2005, December, uh, but in uh, kind of in October, November, I learned that uh, Intel Corporation is going to use a portion of my PhD thesis in every single microprocessor they're going to market from 2008. Uh, and that's happening, and today every single iPhone or Samsung Galaxy, they use the same uh, transistor that I built uh, during that time. Uh, but what I learned uh, throughout that process is, uh, electronics is today used only for computation, communication, and display technology. But it can be used for things which we never envisioned. So when I became an academic, I started working on those kind of things, like uh, water purification, uh, developing uh, artificial skin. Um, my, I was born in Bangladesh, and I've seen many acid victims. When I came to US, I learned about like, you know, the, uh, the wounded soldiers, and there are half a million population all over the world. They get like, you know, the various kinds of uh, uh, road accidents, injuries. So how we can actually help them out or something like a dental brace, uh, which actually can have LEDs uh, to enhance uh, your bone regeneration, or something like, you know, for my mom, who is 70 years old, to have, like, you know, she has arthritis, to have, like, you know, the digital uh, precision thermal therapy, which is compliant and stretchable in, uh, like, you know, in its uh, architecture. So it can be used or wrapping around the finger or in the uh, shoulder or in the kneecap, wherever it's required. So basically, all I want to like to say is that the potential of electronics is tremendous, and it's going to be like you know that occupying and helping us and empowering us throughout the decades and going like on you know, the centuries. So we have we are just in the bottom of where we have seen the impact of electronics, and that's actually what I'm trying to enable uh, down the road. Thank you so much. To eliminate the amount of suffering and pain that you do through your work across the world is incredible. Thank you. Next is health and medicine corporate. 
These are the finalists and new corporate fellows. And the winner is Sphere in the UK. Hi, this is the Sphere team in Bristol. Uh, we're sorry we can't join you tonight. We're incredibly honored and proud to be nominated in the uh, World Technology uh, Awards. Uh, within the project, we're developing uh, a suite of sensors that are deployed at home and a data fusion infrastructure sat behind that to infer health-related behaviors over very long periods of time in large populations. In fact, our technology deployment in 100 local homes starts next week, so we're pretty busy getting ready for that. Sorry, we, we're sorry we can't join you guys. Enjoy the evening, and we look forward to catching up with all the finalists and the award winners after the competition. So uh, enjoy your evening, and from all of us here in Bristol, have fun. Yay! So um, just so you know, Sphere is doing this incredible project where they're observing your behavior in the home in, in, in enormous detail, seemingly innocuous behavior, just average behavior in the home, and using that to improve your health. And it's working in, in very substantial ways. Uh, it's, an, it's a non-traditional winner or finalist for us in that field, but I think it's the beginning of a whole new territory of these sort of feedback loops that are somewhat intelligent and analyzing on the fly um, and giving you feedback to help your behavior in the way that you'd like to help it. Uh, so it's really, really interesting. Uh, and I'm, I'm uh, congratulating them again. Next category is IT hardware individual. These are the finalists and new WTN fellows. And you, as you already know, it's Dr. Peter Fisher uh, for those nanobots. Next category, IT software individual. These are the new W10 fellows and finalists. And the winner is Mohammed Essen Haq. Can a computer help you improve your social skills? I know it sounds counterintuitive. Our research shows otherwise. In 2012, while I was doing my PhD at MIT, I had an opportunity to go to a conference that was intended for individuals who may have Asperger's syndrome. And there I met somebody who told me that he has difficulty making eye contact with people. Uh, once I start talking, he doesn't realize that he is monologuing. He would love to get some help, but he fears social stigma. And he told me that if he could get some sort of automated technology that he could practice at home within his own privacy, nobody has to find out, that could change his life. And that gave me motivation to build my automated conversation coach, also known as Mark. Mark is a 3D character who can see you, listen to you, and respond to you in real time, and can give you feedback on your conversation skills. So I validated Mark in the context of a job interview with 90 MIT undergrad students and showed that students who got the feedback were perceived to be better candidates. And when there was a press release on this work, we received more than 2,500 emails from people saying that, hey, I would love to use this technology. How can I use this? And that prompted us to build RockSpeak, R-O-C-Speak.com, where now anybody with a computer browser could go online turn their webcam and practice speaking and immediately get feedback on smile intensity, volume modulation, body language, filler word usage, pitch variation, and much more. And so far, more than 10,000 people have used it. Now, if you look at it, our research started to help individuals who may have social difficulty, but there are all sorts of other possibilities. For example, public speaking, job interview, negotiation, customer service training, telemedicine, assessment technology, speed dating, and more. And I look forward to seeing how this technology 
could open up all these possibilities in the future. Thank you. Pretty cool, huh? Next category, IT Software Corporate. These are the finalists and new corporate fellows. And the winner is Greenwave Systems, who I believe are here tonight. Thank you. Uh, it's incredible. So the founder and CEO of the company apologizes for not being able to be here tonight. Um, but you got me. So uh, what do we do? Um, the when the company started eight years ago, our vision was to really create a platform that is scalable, flexible, modular, and interoperable to deliver managed services through IoT, both for the consumer and the enterprise, and also for video delivery and networking. Um, today, we have around 8 million devices deployed around the world. And what does that really mean? We don't really make the devices. We want to make it easier for, inter for it to interoperate and intercommunicate. So think about this. When you're going home on a Friday night from work, you're, you're tired. You log on social media, you're on Facebook, and you type in hashtag going home, it's cold outside. Your home automatically starts turning up the thermostat. When you get close to home, your garage opens, you get in, your lights turn on, everything's groovy. So that's how we want to help innovate and help the world to make connections around the world. Thank you. I have a feeling that's going to impact things beyond uh, opening your garage door, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> Next category is law. These are the finalists and new WTN fellows. The winner is Robin Feldman. I'm Robin Feldman. I can barely see over this podium, but I'll, I'll do my best on my tiptoes. I'm a professor in the University of California system, and as our wonderful host said, I love what I do. I run a program called Startup Legal Garage, where we provide free legal services for early stage tech and life science companies, um, with a particular focus on women entrepreneurs. So a lot of companies in the valley that are just brilliant never make it across the valley of death because, among many reasons, they don't have their legal ducks in a row. They aren't set up properly. They don't have their intellectual property in place. And so when they go out for financing, they die at that point. And what we try to do is to help make sure that everything is set up and get them across. We help at least 60 companies a year. Um, and what we're most proud of is that all of the attorneys that work in our program, we have more than 60, all the students, no one is permitted to take anything. No deferred payment, no stock. Everybody in the program has to do what they do for free to help these companies get started. I'd like to thank Tronk. I'd also like to thank the WTN. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you. Next category, materials individual. These are the finalists and new W10 fellows. And the winner is Mungi Bawendi. I'm honored to be selected as a finalist for the 2016 World Technology Awards. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but in case I win, I wanted to let you know a little bit about my work. I've been working on quantum dots, small particles of semiconductors, and other kinds of nanoparticles for a few decades. And it's been really uh, interesting to see these materials grow from a curiosity in the lab uh, to something that really has found applications in real life. Uh, we've been working on devising new syntheses, uh, really characterizing them at a very fundamental level and uh, 
applying them in all sorts of areas. It's really uh, an example of the triumph of uh, fundamental research and curiosity-driven research developing in something that's and a material that's found in real applications. Thanks again. Next category is space individual. These are the finalists and new WTN fellows. The winner is Jeff Bezos. <laughs> who cannot be with us tonight. Guess where we are? The pre-mingling remarks. Because I would think that now that you've seen who some of the people are in the room that you did not speak to, that you will want to. Do you agree with me? Yeah. So I hope you enjoyed that. We gave you a taste of some of the most amazing innovators in the world. In this room alone were five of the winners and four or five of the finalists out of 175 finalists just from this year alone. And we've been doing this for 15 years. The WTN community is incredible. These are the people creating the future. And we're playing our role in speeding up the process for good by encouraging the serendipitous connections that otherwise would be random and introducing them to each other, introducing them to new ideas, introducing ideas in effect to each other. At a moment in history when the pace of change is so great that it is impossible for anyone, despite even those who say that they can, to predict how this is all gonna play out. But if we don't step in the thick of it, if we don't identify who the people are that are making these changes, and we don't help them see each other, and we don't help them see the implications of their work, then we're just going to be carried along thoughtlessly, maybe even dangerously, into the future. But if we can identify who they are, bring them together, celebrate them in that process, and acknowledge that the mutation of innovation, when it works, is the evolution at the heart of life. On that note, I would like to have us all give another round of applause for the winners of this year's World Technology Awards and the finalists that are not in this room as well. And just think for a second as you clap for them about what an exciting time it is that we live in as long as we engage with them and with ourselves in creating that future. Congratulations to you all. Now, go have some more drinks and some food, and thanks to our hosts again, Tronk, and uh, enjoy yourselves, enjoy meeting each other. <laughs>